Welcome back guys, this is Derek Kirby and we are back for another Mavericks postgame show and more importantly another Mavericks victory. That is 10 out of 12 for the Mavericks. They are cooking and now they are mere percentage points behind the San Antonio Spurs for the 7 seed in the Western Conference. What's more? They are still just two games back of the five seed. They have plenty of time to move up those rankings. We kept talking about that log jam in the Western Conference. It's finally actually playing out where the Mavericks are able to get substantial forward progress and momentum. Are my glasses showing too much shine and glimmer? I feel like they are. Give me a second. All right, I can see again. Eyes have to snap back and adjust. But the Mavericks get a big victory here, a 115-104 victory at the AAC. You get a great game out of Kristaps Porzingis, a good bounce back game for him for sure. I, I saw people kind of joking like, oh, it looks like that little vacation he took in Miami during the All-Star break paid off for him. Well, perhaps it did. Perhaps it allowed him to refocus because this is about as big as he's played for us in this game. He came out and he rebounded well, he scored well, he asserted his will. When KP comes out and he's right physically and mentally, he's he's unguardable. He is the unicorn. He is a first team all NBA type talent. The problem is getting that version of KP regularly. Now in this game he gets you 28 and 14 fantastic stuff again making all kinds of plays for the Mavericks knocking down threes getting putbacks tip in staying after it very very big stuff from KP that you love to see you love to see it meanwhile you also get Luka Doncic rolling out yet another triple double it's become so ho-hum for him you look at it and you say 22 12 and 12 mm, that's a little bit like yeah it, it's a triple double but you know Luka's usually rolling out like 30 or something so that just speaks to how high of a bar he set. This isn't Ben Simmons triple doubles where he's rolling out 14, 11, and 10. Like, and that's a nice stat line. But for Luka, that would be like, ooh, what happened? Where, where was your game at, man? So great, great job by the Mavericks there. This game was very back and forth, very closely contended. The Spurs had the lead at half, and the Mavericks pulled away late. And that's another critical area of growth for them. This is a team that has struggled in the crunch time over the last couple of years. It's been well, well, well documented. And for them to pull away and on the backs of Luka and KP specifically pull away from the Spurs is big. The Spurs now have lost two straight to the Thunder, who the Mavericks beat before the Spurs. Um, so they lost to the, the Thunder. Now they've lost to the Mavericks. You are mere percentage points behind San Antonio. And you have a chance to keep building momentum this team it really is a a situation where this season has been in multiple chapters as Saad Youssef pointed out the pre-covid or health and safety protocols days the team was you know a little over 500 but had some very nice wins in there and they played a lot of that even without KP about 10 games then you bring him back into the mix you start to cook but then health and safety protocols it's a disaster for the next several weeks. Four and 10 at one point through about 18 games, even a few games with all your guys back. And we talked about that too, how like conditioning and strength and everything just take time to build back. And this team looked lost at times. They looked like they just had no fight or effort in them. And that's what the red flag was with me. But, you know, I guess I can understand when you're, when you're dealing with something that is, you know, just wreaks havoc on your body and on your health. And, you know, a couple of those guys missed an extended period of time and were hit pretty hard by the, uh, by the virus and everything. So working back from that, I can totally understand how if you just don't feel right and you're just sapped of strength, then it's going to be hard to really, like, have the fight to play in a game, like, especially when another team's punching you in the face repeatedly. So it is what it is. But now, again... 10 and 2 in their last 12. Did I say 10 and 12 in their last 12? If I did, shame on you, DDP. That's bad. That's bad. That's, a, that's unforgivable. But regardless, the team 
is cooking. They are a red hot team right now. And I think they're a team to look out for because, again, if you take away that middle of the season stretch, this team has been much better defensively. The numbers are skewed because of that. If you take their defensive performance in the first 10 games, take out that middle stretch of about 14 to 18 games, and now give us what we've had post, uh, I guess, getting everybody back, everybody back into the flow where the team is finally able to kind of build some momentum. This team is much better defensively. So that's a strong growth. That's strong growth there. The offense is also kind of rounded back into flow a little bit. It's still not a lights out offense. It's not performing like last year, but at the same time, I'm okay with the offense stepping back just a little bit so long as your defense steps up. And if Luka and KP are healthy and good to go, then you've still got enough firepower and mismatch nightmare for the other team to inflict upon them that you can get a lot of quality wins. Now, in this game, the Mavericks have very good distribution throughout. Richardson gets you 12-4. and four. I want to see more from Richardson, man. I'm not, I'm not satisfied with what I've seen from him so far. I think he's a nice player, but if we're talking about max money, I, I don't, I'm out on that right now. And maybe I'll feel differently by the time the season ends where he's at. But right now, I'm still not super, super content with him as a third option. Uh, Maxi Kleba as well, 11-7 and seven from him. That's pretty big there. Willie Colley Stein with 10. He, he gets flashes every now and then. I imagine he's probably, I think he was a two-year deal, but a team option in year two. And so I imagine he's just a one-year kind of like stopgap while they try to put something else together this summer. As we know, they can create a max uh, salary slot. So we'll see what they do with that, whether it's one guy, multiple guys, we'll see. Um, Hardaway Jr., also a bit of a rough night, 9-3. and three. That's not, you know, usually Rich or Hardaway will give you something, and when neither of them are giving you a whole lot, it tends to kind of be building up for a, a rougher stretch. And Brunson only gives you 8, so not at all what you would expect in that regard. But again, your top two guys were so good, and you spread out the points well enough throughout the other guys that it didn't really make a huge difference you were able to bridge that gap and get a quality win. Now, a couple things I want to point out here. Let me see here. This was uh, before... This kind of goes to the point I was making earlier. This was before the game yesterday. This was Mavs PR, uh, specifically David Maurer, pointing this out. He says, The Mavericks in their first 10 games and in their last six have an 11-5 and record with a defensive rating of 101.8. In 18 games from January 15th until February 14th, basically the COVID period, they went 7-11 and with a defensive rating of 120. So, again, that, that further demonstrates, illustrates what I was trying to say earlier as far as this team before and after, like once they really got back after COVID, how good they've been on the defensive end compared to the middle chunk, which is admittedly a sizable chunk, but it skews the numbers. So this team is, as I kept saying, better than what we were seeing during that stretch, even if I did eventually get pulled a little bit kicking and screaming into feeling like, oh man, this might not work. We might need a massive trade. To be clear, I still think they should be buyers at the market. You can be a buyer, without having to say, I'm putting a second mortgage on my house. You can figure out how to do that. You can figure out ways to address existing, still existing weaknesses on this team. Uh, Chuck Cooperstein chimes in on that as well then to give further context. He says the Lakers have a top defensive rating in the NBA at 106.1. So the Mavericks, again, their first 10 games and the, the six going into this last game, 101.1 what was it, 0.8? 101.8, nearly five full points, or I guess four and a half points, better defensively than the Lakers over the whole season. Now, again, we're talking 16 games versus an entire season. So I get it. It's a sample size. You can pluck numbers and kind of look at things. But it just goes to show they have been really good on the defensive end during that stretch. So let me see here. 
So Dallas is a game and a half back of Denver for the six seed and two back of Portland for the five seed. Pretty good stuff there. Mavs PR after the game points out KP finished with 28 and 14, which is his third consecutive double double and his seventh in his last 12 games. The Mavericks are seven and two this season when he gets a double double and four and zero oh when he gets 20 points and 10 rebounds. 16 and seven all time with the Mavericks in such games. So pretty nice there. Of his 14 rebounds, four were offensive. That's as well a season high for him. That's nice. He was 11 of 17 from the field for, that's a field goal percentage of 64.7%. And uh, it's his best field goal percentage since he went 12 of 15 at Indiana on January 20th. So very good stuff from KP here. I'm hoping that he can turn a little bit of a corner. You know, it happened last year where he, you know, this was, I'm talking about like bubble, but even before that, around January, February, and it was really more January for him. He turned the corner. KP running the five. There are still things you have to do to kind of protect him, but there's a lot you can benefit from with running him in that situation. And when they actually take care of it, he's a different player. So if you guard his weaknesses, guard against them, and let him play to his strengths, go figure. He can be a real difference maker for this team. I want to see if there's anything else of note I want to call out here real quick. Uh, Dallas shot 52% from the field in this game. Very, very good production from them as a team. Uh, 33% from three. Not great. The Spurs, conversely, shot 43%. On a lot fewer attempts, they were 12 of 28 versus the Mavericks being 13 of 40. But even still, uh, the fact just going on sheer number of makes, basically even playing field there. Uh, you do a good job getting to the line, 16 of 19. Pretty strong there, pretty strong, and you converted them pretty well. They did have a, an unusually high turnover amount with 14. That's a little uncharacteristic of this team. They tend to protect the ball pretty well. And it's even, you know, you get six out of Luca, two out of Richardson, one out of KP, one out of Finney. So, yeah, it's, uh, it is what it is. The team, a little bit uncharacteristic there, but still took care of business in other ways. They win, majorly win the rebounding battle 51 to 30, including 13 offensive boards compared to six. That is is where this game is won and lost for Dallas, is winning the battle of the boards, especially those second-chance opportunities, opened up a lot for Dallas, and just in capitalizing on it. Um, you know, there was a big play late where KP gets an offensive rebound, kicks it out to Dorian Finney-Smith in the left corner, and he knocks down a three. That's a big shot. So a lot of good things are starting to happen for this team, I still think they need to address rebounding, even though you get a big rebounding game as a team here. I think there's more you can and should look to do. But yeah, it's um, it's an encouraging win. Now their next game is... Again, today, against Oklahoma City, who they beat two games ago before the Spurs, the last game before the All-Star break, if I'm not mistaken... They won that one 87-78, so they're going to play at Oklahoma City today, and uh, we'll see what happens with this. OKC 15-21, and 21. you know, that was a rough game for OKC, and you won that one without even having to play Luka, which is great. However, I would caution against, you know, against phoning this one in, if you will, against assuming, like penciling it in as a win. OKC can be sneaky good this year. They've got some very good wins over teams that you wouldn't expect them to beat. So I think you need to be absolutely on your toes and prepared for a tough contest. But we'll see where we go from there. For now, quality win. 10 of 11, or sorry, 10 of 12. And uh, things are starting to look up for this team. I want to see... One more thing real quick here. I'm going to take another peek at the standings. So I talked about how close you were to them. Uh, two games back of the Blazers. And then it's another game and a half before you get to the four seed. So yeah, you can make a push to the five seed. That is still very much in the cards. You've got a full game lead now on the Grizzlies, who are currently slotted at the nine seed. 
you are in good position to keep rolling. Not only that, you've got momentum. The Spurs, as I said, have lost two straight. Uh, you have the Nuggets, who have good momentum as well. They've also won four straight. The Blazers have won three straight. The Clippers are actually on a backward slide. They've lost three. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Right now, you are tied with the longest winning streak in the West. So that's really good. Four games, I know. It's not a huge amount. But you got momentum behind you. And, uh, hey, it could be worse. You could be the Houston Rockets, who have lost 13 straight with no signs of it ever ending. That one's for you, Eastside. But that's all my time for this video, guys. Take a moment to drop a like, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace. From Prospect to Lancer.